good evening once again, and uh, welcome to another edition of the Souls of Black Folk broadcast. Um, I'm uh, student minister Rodney Muhammad here in the Delaware Valley, and also uh, my co-host sharing the platform with me is my dear brother, uh, student minister Michael Muhammad uh, in the great city of uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Um, uh, welcome, brother Michael. It's good to be with you again. Always a and, pleasure. Um, of course, um, um, we always start off any uh, engagement uh, that we want to see a success in inviting uh, the divine spirit of the originator of the heavens and the earth, we believe perfected uh, in Master Fard Muhammad. Uh, and so uh, we say in the name of Allah, which means uh, with the help of Allah, um, in the name of Allah, who came to us in the person of Master Farag Muhammad. We thank him for the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, his exalted servant, uh, the Messiah and a Mahdi figure, the Christ of the Muslim world. Um, and we thank both of them for their servant guiding us today um, under divine protection and divine guidance, the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan, their messianic figure uh, to us today. And so, uh, we greet you uh, once again. We invite you to always go to noi.org. NI, That's noi.org. Uh, and to abbreviate a lot of announcements I could make, if you just go there, you'll find a whole plethora of stuff uh, coming from the Nation of Islam in the way of books, tapes, DVDs, um, fi uh, different uh, videos you can go to uh, to find out about our programs, upcoming events, of uh, the Final Call Radio, which runs 24-7. Uh, uh, you can find out all of that uh, just by going to NOI.org. Uh, and we hope you continue to listen to our program. Uh, Brother Michael and I, we were blessed in our, um, in our debut, uh, which was our sort of like virgin program. We were just getting started uh, and we're breaking this in and so we're thankful to you for your patience and the many people who had already viewed us. Mm -hmm. uh, and we thank almighty God for that. But we were, we were just into a discussion that we didn't know how to end because we started everything off with our dear brother, Wakil Allah, who is a, a noted author, um, an activist um, and a young brother who started uh, very young uh, in this. And he's authored books that we, uh, told you about before, and uh, we'll go into some of that in our tonight's discussion, but we were talking about the 5% nation and its origin and some of its challenges, uh, and were there any setbacks, and if so, uh, what were they? We, we even tried to get into where everyone is now, where is it now, um, and we were just closing out the show, man, and we were getting taking a deep dive into things, but we're here for part two and we're blessed to have him back. And we wanted to take tonight, you know, a deep dive into uh, the subculture uh, that was born out of uh, hip hop. Um, you know, hip hop's development, uh, which uh, everyone knows was to really have its origins on the Eastern seaboard um, there in New York City uh, and other places up and down uh, the East Coast, uh, hip hop music. And you know, what is what, what happened in the 70s and what happened when the 80s got here, you know, many of the record companies and many of the record labels and many of the entertainers began to vanish, uh, became difficult to survive. And um, because of the migration shifts, uh, people call it white flight, white folks left and with the, uh, it was said that Standard Oil, uh, uh, Firestone Tire and General Motors all conspired because with the roadways, they could begin to build another whole reality for white folks. They fled the inner cities, long things short, they went into a place and they began to build a whole new thing called suburbs. Uh, even Dr. King and others in, uh, before his assassination in 1968 talked about monies that should have been coming to the inner city for resources for its residents begin to get shifted 
to help build a little paradise out there for folks in the suburbs at that time uh, in suburban living. And you know, you needed an automobile for that. An automobile has to run on tires, it has to run on gasoline. So Standard Oil was involved, General Motors was involved, Firestone Tire was involved. They played a prominent feature in this new reality. But the change in demographics where whites were securing suburbs and leaving the inner cities depleted, it, it depleted the cities uh, and opportunities began to fade and evaporate. Uh, and it left us uh, poor, uh, it left us um, um, in, a, in, a, in a more depleted uh, and disadvantaged situation, the loss of jobs, the loss of quality education. Uh, and so young people began to hit the streets uh, because the development of their expression of what they were in was really a development uh, reflected from the negative effect of this post-industrial decline. Uh, the political confusion and the economic collapse left us in, in desperation and great despair. So young people were out really expressing what they were in, uh, not what uh, they were manufacturing for themselves, but what we were reacting to from the con prevailing conditions that were around us. So the entertainment sources vanished and the youth took to the streets, man. And before we knew it, it was a thing called break dancing. Uh, we're finding out that in hip hop, you had about three elements. You had to have, you either had a DJ, you had a MC and you had a rapper. I mean, those are the three components that they say were combined with them. And some of the pioneers include DC Cool, Grandmaster Flash, some people might know about those names. By the 80s and 90s, you had Rakim, KRS-One, Chuck D, uh, new, new lingo star coming out like Bling Bling. Uh, I think some of you all know about that for Chisel, uh, for Shizzle. Uh, I, I remember <laughs> Minister Parkon making sure from his grandchildren he had the term right. Uh, but I remember even hearing familiar music from the late 60s and 70s as a backdrop to some, some, some explosive rap and expression coming from the street. And so some of the old artists began to say, hey, you're using my music and you guys are turning up a lot. And so it caused many of the rappers to um, what they call go into some original kind of music uh, clearing so that they can clear the hurdle of um, trying to go back to some of these other artists. Um, you know, you heard the James Brown beat, you heard, you know, different songs. And I know in our mosque, William Hart, leader of the Delphonics is there. And I know when, when the Delphonics were, their star was setting and they weren't selling records. He told me, man, Biggie Smalls made a record uh, from one of theirs and his sold 10 million copies, Biggie Small sold. So, but William said the money just rolled in because in the, at that late date, even though the Delphonics hadn't done anything and William Hart was fortunate that it didn't go to some white folks because Minister Jeremiah Shabazz told him that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told him back in the sixties uh, to make sure to keep his masters. Mm -hmm. And to this day, uh, William Hart of the Delphonics still has checks coming in. So I'm just trying to set the stage for this discussion. By 2017, hip hop surpassed rock uh, as a music genre in America. Uh, but, you know, hip hop with all of its, its fine beginnings uh, born out of honest expression, uh, calling even for peace, uh, there was um, there was something more loving, cheerful, delightful, even rappers delight and, 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 and you know, all behind it. But it seems to have uh, been derailed, run off the rails, as I say, and kind of gone toxic. So we want to talk about some of that tonight. Um, and we're welcoming back our dear brother, Brother Wakil Allah, um, to be with us, to help us. Uh, navigate this and walk through this. And so I think Mer Brother Michael has questions. I have questions. And uh, um, so, uh, you know, Wakilala, what do you think 
from the origins of hip hop because I'm a baby boomer. I, I sort of come from a generation where I can remember, you know, back in the early 60s, the songs that were out, you know, Dionne Warwick and Smokey Robinson and the Temptations and things. And, you know, even rock and roll had to make some breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. um, even um, jazz had to make some breakthroughs. Blues wasn't necessarily understood, um, but uh, all of these things eventually found a platform. Um, and when black folks made a record um, like um, chess records or Cadillac records on 21st Street in Michigan in Chicago, white folks could just come and do a cover song. So our song sold in the black world, but to white America, these records didn't sell. So Elvis Presley, Pat Boone and others would sing the record over and it would be a big sale in white America. But uh, those black artists didn't make the, the money in the expansion of sales. They only made money from what sold uh, among black folks. But with hip hop, white folks couldn't copy that. Uh, they couldn't just take that and say, well, we're gonna take fight the power and have some white groups in it and make something off of it. So what are you, what are your thoughts about hip hop coming in? Of course, you know, generations of us maybe not being quick to understand it and, and embrace it. And I was interested in seeing how you, how you saw it from, from where you sat at that time. Um, yes, sir. You know, it was very interesting because, um, and again, thank you for having me on your platform. I think all this time together, 360, especially with the three of us on here in the generations. Um, when hip hop first came about, you know, it was born, or they say it was founded in 1973. And uh, the brother that was really instrumental in that is brother Cool Herc. Uh, he just had a birthday the other day, right. he was the 16th. So shout out to, one, to what they refer to as the godfather of hip hop a very big friend of the Nation of Islam and the 5% Nation, without a shadow mm -hmm. of a doubt. Um, but when hip hop first came about, I believe that it didn't really face that much resistance. When I say first came about, I'm talking about the real commercial aspect of it. We can go uh -huh. ahead and Sugar Hill game. Some of our brothers from the state of New Jersey. <laughs> and uh -huh. then like I said, Sylvia Robinson was tied into that. So the, the previous generation of the James Browns, like you mentioned, the the Delphonics and the cool mm -hmm. the gangs and even the jazz musicians, you know, everybody was kind of intertwined in the culture. And from that, their babies and their children created this art form, you know, known mm -hmm. as hip hop. So initially when the, when cool in the gang came out, right, with rappers delight, um, it was a slight hesitation because it was something that was new that hit the airwaves, but it was quickly adapted because they utilized the same format that you, alluded to in mm -hmm. reference to sampling, right? Mm -hmm. They sampled one of the greats, uh, Nile Rogers, right? Sheik of Good Times. So Good Times was already a powerful hit. And when the brothers came on top of that and rapped on top of that, uh, I think that the previous generation was kind of similar to, to knowing that, like you had, um, like the, the fat back band had something out there with music on it and rapping. Then you always had like even the big brass bands and People would kind of rap over the beat, the orchestra the, or the band leaders and what have you. So I think it was something that we were familiar with, especially in the black community and dealing with the science of rhetoric. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how it really ties in to uh, the subculture of black people. I often say that hip hop is just black music. That's another form of black music. And we as black people in our communities always had this nature and rhythmic beat of conversation with one another, right? One of the things that stood out with some of the um, uh, the recorders or the archivists of the culture mm -hmm. of hip hop, they said that the five percenters stood out within that culture because they were quote unquote gifted conversationalists, right? And when you look at the icons of the hip hop movement, the icons of the hip hop movement, meaning who we look up to as far as one of the elements of knowledge are all like what you would call like revolutionaries or freedom fighters, right? You got brother Minister Malcolm X, and you got brothers like Minister Farrakhan, you know, even with brother like, you know, the Black Panthers, right? Uh, Kwame Torre, 
H. Rob Brown, uh, Huey P. Newton, um, all of these, uh, yeah, all these different revolutionary, even civil rights icons like um, Martin Luther King, et cetera, right? So they always respected their predecessors and ancestors that came in front of us. So I think mm -hmm. the uh, respect level for hip hop was there, you know, initially, um, even though it may have caught in some flack after a while for what they would say is lack of originality or the sampling of beats. And really at the end of the day, the real issue with the sampling thing was, you alluded to something with the great brother William Hart and what the most honorable lives Muhammad told him that you should mm -hmm. own your masters, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things with the whole sampling process was that a lot of our artists wasn't getting the credit for that. So they wasn't getting paid for that because they didn't own their masters. That's somebody right. owned their publishing and owned their rights. So was somebody not even part of the culture, not even part of the ethnicity, don't look nothing like them, really extracting all of the monies and funds from them. So that kind of created little different rifts as well, you know, mm. in, in the community. But I think uh, at the end of the day, the pulse of hip hop is really, is revolutionary. <laughs> Just like the different mm -hmm. social groups started or what they call the youth street organizations, they all came out of really like the 60s, or even the 50s, you know, the need mm -hmm. for freedom of inequality and the ability to stand up and express yourself. You know, just like we had the Ozzy brothers, right? Ozzy brothers just had a versus against uh, Earth, Wind and Fire. Very powerful. A lot of people watched it. And, uh, you know, one of the things they would say, like, you know, express yourself, right? So it's really about expression. And the people that really yeah. that really need to be heard in any society is always the youth. So mm -hmm. you always need to pay attention to the voice of the youth. And the youth, that became their platform, you know, was the hip hop culture. So outside of the different nuances and variances between, you know, the youth and the elderly in a sense mm -hmm. at the time or their parents, et cetera. Outside of that, I don't think there was a major, a major distraction until years later, once the vulgarness came into hip hop. Well, that's and that that was one of the places I wanted to go tonight because mm -hmm. I was about to deal with this whole thing about, you know, I'm dealing with a concept about models of control. Like we certainly were controlled when we were brought here to uh, put our bodies into the service of of, of labor. Uh, and breeding and even uh, experimentation for furthering their own medical science. But um, it seems like with hip hop, which white America can't claim they created, uh, it didn't come out of their imagination. Uh, it just wasn't their idea. Um, no one knew it was coming, uh, but when it got here, it was an expression of the inner city dilemma uh, and even inner city suffering, but somewhere it degenerated into uh, what some say were three component parts. I made a note of it, violence, machismo, and arrogance. Uh, mm -hmm. It seemed to somehow get planted into the uh, stream of expression. And we went from rapper's delight to some say gangster rap, but, um, it, it was the argument is that real black culture, real black expression, um, white America could not really understand real black culture and real black expression. So what white America needed to do was sort of repackage it uh, and put it in a form that white America could really digest. Uh, and with $10 billion uh, coming in through rap as an industry, 80% um, of that was generated through the sale to whites mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to black folks. But it, 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 it went from you know, Man Child in the Promised Land, a book I had to read back in high school, but right. it dealt with the ghettos of New York. Mm -hmm. It went from Man Child in the Promised Land to Pimps and Hoes mm -hmm. uh, and this kind of thing. So it seems they, they recreated, you know, life forms in that subculture and those became highlighted in the music expression in that. And this is 
the reality that white America began to buy into uh, in, in huge numbers of uh, just generating untold sums of money. Mm -hmm. Brother Rodney, you mentioned something interesting. Um, and Joaquin, you made a point about the 5% being conversationalist and having an impact on hip hop. Um, you know, from the Sugar Hill Gang with Rapper's Delight, you know, um, the message with Melly Mel mm -hmm. and with mm -hmm. Curious Five, very positive song, classic right. hip hop, um, but also the influences of Cold Crush Brothers. You got five percenters in the Cold Crush Brothers, right? So now you see the infusion of consciousness in the music through those who have gotten some type of enlightenment through mm -hmm. the 5%, particularly 120 or the Supreme right. Wisdom Lessons. And it is my, um, it's not even a belief anymore. It's just a fact that this transition into this level of consciousness through the lessons. And for example, the iconic jacket of the great rock Allah with the universal flag on the back as a billboard and a poster board for consciousness in the 5%. I guess why kill my question to you is from your research and from your study, how much of the uh, influence of the 5%, particularly the language of the lessons in the raps, do you think mm. has played a part in the infusion of consciousness and the golden era of hip hop, particularly between 86 and maybe 96 for that 10 year period? Right, that's a very powerful question, a very powerful observation. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, you know, in the very beginning, I would say that as far as the language goes and the level of consciousness, I almost want to say that the five percenters, i.e. the Nation of Islam, as you hear Brother Rod Kim will give shout outs on his albums and records, Peace to the Nation of Islam, because in the five percenters, we taught that the original people would just be the Nation of Islam, you know, the black, brown, red, and the yellow, the original nation, right, that has no beginning or ending older than the sun, moon, and stars. So all these different aspects of wisdom, which means wise words being spoken, that you would hear from mouth to ear, right, every day within the community, this helps spawn the consciousness of hip hop. And take it back to New York City, which is the Mecca, right? In the five percenters, we refer to Harlem, New York, as the Mecca, right? Uh, we say that, um, the father, Allah, Brother Clown 13X Smith, came from out of the root, right? The root meaning the temple or the mosque, number seven, right? Why do we refer to that as such? In New York in the 60s, as the youth were coming up, coming into forms of consciousness, it was primarily Brother Minister Malcolm X and his helpers there at number seven that was grabbing the air of the youth. They would put out these big platforms right on 127th Street and 7th mm -hmm. Avenue where the law school or the five center headquarters is today. They would set it right there, right across the street, right? You will see Brother Minister Malcolm X, Captain Yusuf Shah, Minister James Shabazz, Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan. They would have these big events. And if you see the pictures that was taken out there, you will see all the little youth in front of there looking up at Minister Malcolm X and looking at the Muslims in amazement. Right. And they would take this information and they would go back and they would share this information with one another. And then eventually some of the brothers, the FOI started taking these brothers under their wing. And primarily we can look at, you know, again, the father, brother Clarence 13X, when he came out of the temple to start his mission to teach the youth, him and a group of other brothers and sisters started teaching the youth the knowledge. Right. And the wisdom. And they gave them a form of what is called supreme mathematics and supreme alphabet. Uh, which came from the study of the problem book by Master W.D. Fawad Muhammad, uh, which deals with the 13th question, Islam is mathematics, and mathematics is Islam. And it stands true, you can prove it in no limited time. And it says that, you know, math has 10, no 10 numbers, right? And alphabets, there's 10 letters of the alphabet, right? And it talks about the study of the numbers in the alphabet. And these brothers, in the collective came up with the supreme mathematics and the alphabet, which means every day 
there was a moral principle and a definition that you had to learn to recite by heart and break it down. So it sounds just like a rap. Like uh, today's mathematics, well, I wouldn't go to today's mathematics because mm. when we air this, it'll be different. Um, but take the principle one is knowledge. Knowledge is to know, look, listen, observe, and to respect. Knowledge is the key to all aspects of life. Knowledge is the foundation of all things in existence. Such as the sun is the foundation to the solar system, so is the black man the foundation to his family. Wisdom is a manifestation of knowledge. The ways and actions that you use to make your knowledge known, so to speaking wisely, the wiser dome. Wisdom is second day, most necessary. Wisdom is also the black woman, the earth or the moon. So you would hear these different things being recited to you out in the street. And you'd be like, well, what's that? What are they talking about? Because the language of Islam is meant to attract, that attracted the youth. And the youth are already inclined toward music. One of the things that Brother Clarence 13 x said, he said to the youth one time, he said, you know how you, you know, he said, you know how you make a hit record? They said, well, how? He said, you just play it over and over again. He said, the radio play it over and over again. <laughs> it becomes a hit, it becomes edgy. Wow. So repeat this information that you get. Repeat it to one another, recite it to one another. Go out and teach somebody totally new and teach them to do the same. Because one of the things that he taught was each one teach one. So a principal in New York FOR at the time was that an FOI had to go and teach 10 others. So you had to go out, you had to get 10 fish, right? 10 fruit of yours to bring them to the mosque and eventually to bring them to add them on to the knowledge itself. So the father actually did the same thing with the youth. He said, okay, you got to get 10. You know, you go out, you won, you get 10 more people, you bring them back, 10 more you. And uh, one of the things that Brother Michael asked me last time, and I realized I didn't go into it, he asked about the first now born and the impact of the first now born. And I skipped over that somehow. Uh, yeah. Um. But the first nine born are very instrumental for the consciousness in New York City. And those are the first nine brothers that brother the father Allah taught. They became his first nine born because the number nine and all the symbolism was being taught in the temple. The number nine represents being born. It takes nine months to born a baby, right? Nine months to be complete. Born is to be complete, right? The ninth letter in the supreme alphabet is I. You know, I is self, the self man is God. I is also Islam, which is I self, Lord and master. So after these nine were complete, they would birth more babies, more understandings, which we say is the children, right? So they went out and they started teaching all these brothers and sisters all this information. And the information they were teaching was the 120 lessons, as Brother Michael said, which was the direct supreme wisdom lessons from Master Fraud Muhammad and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. So you had children ranging from, I would say, maybe eight years old up to like 19 to 21, all reciting 120 lessons like verbatim. Mm -hmm. And I bear witness to that myself because coming up, that's how it was. You would see right. a person yeah. nine to 10 years old that didn't have nothing to do, the parents they had nothing to do with the nation of Islam or anything. They learned the lessons by being taught by another nine-year-old, another 10-year-old, and they can recite it to you verbatim at 10 or 12. They can, you know, they can stalk down a, a 21-year-old and bomb him for not knowing his lessons because they were so swift with it. But that consciousness, that energy that was put out there prior to hip-hop being formed through Brother Cool Herc in 1973, which I want to speak on, um, he said that at the time that they came together to have this collective to really usher in what would be called hip hop, he said the number one thing that they wanted to do was have a safe place, a safe haven, right? Mm -hmm. And the Bronx was like, man, the Bronx, like, like they said, like somebody dropped a bomb on it at that time. Mm -hmm. We looking at the South Bronx. I mean, it was like the builders was on, just oh, demolished, mm -hmm. you know, fire, burnings. It was just pure mm -hmm. poverty. So there was a lot of gang violence. There was a lot of, you know, violence on the people, innocent people. So when he had this event, you know, at Sedgwick, he had this event. He said the main thing they wanted to do was have peace. So he said some of the gangs, they wanted peace, right? So they would come around and the music and the dancing and the women kind of helped to ease their mind a little bit. He said, but it would have never been possible. He said, because there was one group that came that really created the peace. He said that was the five percenters. 
<laughs> he said, when the five percenters came, I was the first party that was considered the first party of hip hop. He said, when the five percenters came, that's when everything was peace. So were they there that 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 night that he said to have had that party and and um, oh yeah, behold the birth of of hip hop or yeah or something yeah. yeah the well, five you know, Minister he, Farrakhan said to us once years back. And it, it was actually in the 80s that yeah. one song could do more than hundreds and hundreds of lectures that he himself had given to impact uh, our people. And of course, with a song, you got rhythm and you, you're rehearsing it over and over and over again. So do you think that a lot of the toxic music now being rehearsed over and over again plays a role in a lot of the carnage, the, the, the bloodshed that you see us spilling amongst each other in our communities uh, nationwide. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it is called social engineering, as we mm. know. Um, and the repetitive music, especially when you teach a child, it's like it says in our scriptures, the devil will make evil fair seeming to the people. Mm. And if you raise somebody up on that kind of mental swine, if you will, that becomes their diet, you know, and as a man, a woman thinkers, so they become. So if you refer to yourself as a B or as an H or as an N word, you know, that's what you become. It becomes a repetitious learning kind of a thing. And this is specific. It's by design. And I would say within hip hop, though, within the culture, it's the same mathematics as we have it in the lessons, meaning that it's not the majority of the of white people that's like, okay, let's corrupt hip hop. <laughs> you know? That's well, not really, yeah, yeah, that's not really right. the right that they even have. Most, most of them are there, they enjoy the music, they're fascinated by the artists, and they literally, genuinely look mm -hmm. up to the artists, you know. But those who pull the strings, those who are the financiers, those who really call the tune, because nothing comes out without their permission as far as coming through the corporate labels is different corporations that push the filth on hip hop. This is actually a corporate driven thing. The vulgarity mm -hmm. in hip hop, the degeneration in hip hop yeah. is done through the corporatizing. So it's coming from a, a, a corporate suite as opposed to the streets. Absolutely. And it starts there. So it's life. Mm -hmm. imitating art at one time art you know can imitate life but now life is imitating art so mm -hmm. one of the things that uh the father of allah clara 13x and the elders is to teach he would say stop imitating those who are imitating you <laughs> stop <laughs> imitating those who are imitating you you know you are the original man you are the originator you know mm -hmm. not the copy right so we originate we don't try to duplicate, we just originate who we are and let others do the grafting in a sense. So once we get back to our true nature and our true self, you know, which is the beat, which is the core again of black music, which at one point in time was called soul, right? Soul mm -hmm. music, you know, so it hit us right there in the soul, the heart and the mind and skilled evil people at the top saw the opportunity to distract us from that. And uh, like the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan said, they'll throw a rock and hide their hand. So you see somebody in front of you rapping filth, but you don't know this person is back by corporate structure, corporate right. companies, marketing and everything else by people that don't look anything like him or her. The people that they work for look nothing like them, are not part of the culture, but they are really the purveyors of those who are calling mm -hmm. the tune. And you know, Wakil Alive, you're so right because that happened out of Philadelphia with C. Mm -hmm. Dolores Tucker, who had okay. been prominent here in the NAACP. And of course she set up the Martin Luther King Nonviolent Association, but mm -hmm. she began to clash with the actual rappers for um, musical content that was considered violent, misogynistic. Uh, and at one point she and even Tupac Shakur were mm -hmm. clashing in the public, uh, but ultimately as, as sister kept fighting, she began to see 
behind the rapids, just like you're saying, that the real culprits were these corporate folks sitting up in these uh, suites uh, designing things and then taking these artists, unleashing them back on the community with this terrible toxic expression of how to deal with our reality. And uh, it was Ooh. certainly making it worse. And so she died fighting them as opposed to the rappers, mm -hmm. uh, just like you said. And uh, I also remember um, the minister even becoming so upset doing a large speaking engagement one time. He talked about snatching people off the stage and whooping them because we, we can't allow you to represent us this way to the world. Right. And part of the pledge in the Million Man March was a pledge to support black artists who showed respect for themselves and respect for the ears of the human family. And, uh, but we've never seemed to come together as a community. We don't seem to have a good reward and punishment system. Like you make good music, uh, it works well. Um, we reward you, but you make bad music, toxic music, things that could in a hypnotic way without people even really realizing uh, becoming more violent um, and carrying out acts of violence and that kind of thing. We don't seem to have a punishment system for that. Like we won't buy your music, we won't buy your record. And so what, what, what they're saying is happening is by people buying this expression I've even heard Russell Simmons talk about it, say, well, a lot of these people are just rapping about their reality, but in truth, you're saying by copying the man that's copying you, <laughs> it wasn't really their reality. It was it was being remade for them. Right. Um, it's all know, recent tools. You know, yeah. one thing, um, Brother Wakil, you mentioned, you mentioned this recruitment process, right? Mm -hmm. One of the one of the, probably the most prominent song that I can remember that really displayed the lessons in the public was the 1990 classic Wake Up by Brand Nubians. Mm -hmm. Where going into the second verse, they go through the 136 or English lesson C1. Can a mm -hmm. devil fool a Muslim? No, not nowadays, son. Do you mean to say the devil fooled them 400 years ago? You know, mm -hmm. um, that became extremely popular. Now you have people who don't know anything about the lessons. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have rappers because the culture of the 5% and the Nation of Islam, it infused in hip hop a certain level of consciousness that sparked through the various um, uh, lectures of the minister going up and down the East Coast. It sparked a revolutionary a spirit in the youth that now yeah. we began to protest in public enemy, fight the power, the death of Yusef Hawkins in 1989. And then from there, it just took off. And now this consciousness of nation of Islam, mm -hmm. the minister's words being quoted in music. Um, and at that time, I believe you were at Morehouse and mm -hmm. all of this is happening. And I travel with uh, poor righteous teachers uh, back in the day and you know as young five percenters we were all in you know with the RZA and the Jizza and the, before that and uh, before the Wu-Tang days and you know going to the parliaments and you're seeing the rappers at that time I believe you were at Morehouse in the 90s and um, I'm interested in knowing how did that aspect of the culture of hip-hop and consciousness help on campus with spreading the knowledge and inviting people into the knowledge of self that didn't know anything about what mm -hmm. you knew since you were a teenager. Mm. How did that help? And how was the, the campus life at Morehouse with the recruiting process? Yes, mm. sir, brother. It was extremely powerful. You know, I had the, um, the privilege and honor to be able to attend Morehouse College you know, uh, in 87, I graduated from high school then went to Morehouse and I was a hardcore five percenter. So when I came to the campus, which is predominantly 
you know, black Christians, the first thing I was kind of in the culture shock, because I'm so used to being around the nation of Islam and the five percenters, and now I'm around a lot of Christian brothers, although extremely valuable, extremely intelligent, right? So I just started teaching Islam off the back, you know, just boom. Every time I saw somebody just teaching it, because it was always an example of something that I could teach on, whether it's about eating pork, whether it's about the Bible, whether it's about we was praying, you know, the concept of God and what have you. And at the time, as the backdrop, as Brother, Brother Michael says, you had like public enemy, you know, you had Just Ice, you know, you had Karis One, you know, um, the Big Daddy Kings that came a little bit later. Um, you had, uh, you know, La Kim Shabazz, then eventually like the Poor Righteous He's Teachers, the Grand Poor Nubian. Right teachers, yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, powerful, brother. King Sun, you right. know. Son. Um, and before that, the world famous Supreme Team. Hey, DJ, right. very instrumental in the culture. But when I came on campus and I started teaching this way, you know, straight from the lessons, I got like nice large size audiences from teaching like this. You know how it is, a cipher. You know, you're starting to cipher and you're building. And uh, then I thought that I got into a little bit of trouble because I'm in a foreign land. And since I'm in Atlanta, I ain't never been there before in my life. And I am advocating the most, I guess, controversial part of the lesson is that the black man is God, which always attracts the people because it's their nature, because it's just the truth. Mm -hmm. um, so I met Brother Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad, you know, which I was shocked and surprised because I was, I was telling you, mm -hmm. um, Brother, <laughs> that I would see you in the final call. You know, Brother Minister Rodney, I would see you. I would see Minister Abdullah, Brother mm -hmm. Akbar. Then I would see Brother Dr. Khaled. But, you know, me being young, you know, 17, 18, I wasn't thinking about, you know, necessarily meeting him because I didn't meet him before that. And I didn't meet Brother Farrakhan really, you know, before that in person. Um, so one day, a week into my tenure at Morehouse College, the great Dr. Khaled pulls up in the stretch limo bins, a white stretch limo bins, right? Jumps out, Minister Tony Muhammad, who's our Minister Abdul Malik Saeed Muhammad is driving, and they calling me, and they like, look, look, look outside, because it's like, it's like a rock star, like, who is this? And when he jumped out the bins, I recognized who it was. I said, yo, that, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's Dr. Khaled. <laughs> what are you doing here? So we were kind of stunned. I'm on the second floor. Sure enough, he walked up, you know, he got the FOI and everything. And they come there and they like this. The Khaled is like, who's the five percent of brother? My heart just went <laughs> all the way down. I was like, yo, the Muslims about to jack me up up in here. I was like, I'm about to get stopped out. This is my concept. Like, okay, I violated somehow. Now I got to pay for it. I was scared. And a brother that was from D.C. said, and I want to be long with the story, but a brother from D.C. said, wait a minute, you believe like Brother Waquil believed? He said, because Waquil believed he's God. My heart again, like, boom. I'm like, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm done in. And then Colin said, brother, he is God. I'm like, what? <laughs> he said, who has a Bible? Brother Randy got the Bible. Now, I, never, I didn't deal with the Bible before this. Colin got the Bible, opened it up to Psalms 82, and read that Bible, you know, in Psalms 82. He are all gods, children of the Lord, high God. God. I was like, man, that's in the Bible? And from there, brother, the Nation of Islam was thick on the campus. And my job was really to rally the students to come to the mosque like every Sunday. We was rolling out there deep. Now, that was in 87. Now, skip from 87, 88, 89 to 90, where there was teaching going on. But honestly, there was a little lull in there. There was a little lull in there from 87. And I'm getting real microscopic with it mm -hmm. to like 89. In 90, and that's what Brother Michael's alluded to or, or talking about when the brand newbies and the poor righteous teachers came on the scene. Mm -hmm. And when they came on the scene and the new freshman class came in in 1990, that's when I really met a lot of the brothers like Dr. Wesley Muhammad that eventually, um, um, or Brother Jackie, uh, Brother Tory. Um, a, a lot of a lot of brothers, man. So mm -hmm. many brothers. Then eventually, a brother 
Murphy, you know, at the time, you no know, K it joined us. And we had a whole, I mean, man, brother Johnny, oh man, it's just so many brothers like a name. We was on campus. So either you became a five percenter or you joined the Nation of Islam. Mm-hmm. That was like your two options. And as far as we concerned, we was both. The FOI felt they was five percenters, and the five percenters felt like they mm-hmm. was FOI because we was rocking strong and rocking all together, you know, living Very together good. and everything. And uh, it was because of the poor righteous teachers and the brand Nubians and Gangstar, who mm-hmm. Brother Michael was real close to, Brother Guru, who went to Morehouse. Right. Um, right. More, these Morehouse. messages really did just the opposite of what we're talking about or what's done today with the vulgarity and the ignorance is put mm-hmm. into the head. But these artists put wisdom in our heads. So the X Clan, you That's know, right. they put a bunch of wisdom on our heads. So everybody wanted to be conscious. Everybody wanted to be righteous. And the one voices that you always heard was like the Nation of Islam. Brother Khaled, you know, he went on to get on Ice Cube's record. I remember when he did that um, with Ice Cube Mm -hmm. um, and all that. And uh, so they heard the voices of Sister Ava on Public Enemy, especially Mm -hmm. Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan. So they started hearing these voices and we had the tape connection on campus, because we started the Nation of Islam Student Association. So, you know, the tape connection was deep. The cassette tapes we had. So the yeah. te- it was like, you know, righteous contraband that you was passing out these tapes, cassette tapes to Minister Farrakhan, and people would come get you. They would come get it from my room. Like my room was like the library or something. Taking out a tape, here, you take this tape, you take this tape, you take this tape, you bring this back. Here's a message to the black man. So we was recycling the information, and we started a hard, nice, powerful core group of brothers and sisters on Atlanta University Center. I mean, the Morehouse, Spellman, Clark, and Morris Brown. And we were deep, the Nation of Islam and the Five Percenters were very deep on campus. And many of these artists would come and they would spend time with us. Like we spent time with Poor Righteous Teachers. You know, we spent time with Rakim. You know, we spent time with, um, like Pete Rock and CL Smooth, like the Jungle mm-hmm. Brothers, man, KRS One, you know. So we spent a lot of time with these artists when they would come visit us in Atlanta on the AUC. And um, it really opened up the people. And that's how I know hip hop is such mm-hmm. a powerful tool, as Brother it, Minister Rock. Right. Said. It, it, it seemed to me too that when hip hop left from um, brothers literally, uh, producing their material, maybe even selling it from the trunk of cars, selling it at at clubs and get togethers where your DJs and MCs and rappers are. Um, the it, it, it seemed that once a lot of these companies got a hold of this, um, you know, and, and they were moving the rap more mainstream. Uh, I guess Russell Simmons got involved uh, with the Def Jam label and, you know, people start coming through and they start generating, you know, larger sums of money. It seemed to be, you know, it seemed to bring the kind of revenue that came in. They were saying that it, it began to change how, you know, you don't look revolutionary wearing, you know, big fur, dark glasses, bunch of jewelry on and everything mm-hmm. it, it's almost like the 60s when mm-hmm. we were coming through and you saw the froze and you saw uh brothers in the army jackets or you you know they were they considered themselves uh mm-hmm. more thinking about the condition of the people in the community and that but then black exploitation came in and you know the, the froze turned into processes and jerry mm-hmm. curls and mm-hmm. you know rather than riding jeeps and that now you want to el Dorado and you know, you're not a revolutionary no more, you're a pimp. Uh, and it, do, do you agree that something like that, you know, might be dramatizing it, oversimplifying, but it seemed like something like that happened with rap, but even a lot more sinister, it seems, uh, with some of the outcome of music becoming toxic. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. I, I do definitely agree with that. But one thing I would say is behind the veil of that, Mm -hmm. is reality you know yeah it's humanity so i i can't think of one honestly and i know i said this last time 
artist in the entertainment field that's not open to the nation of Islam. I mean, I can't think mm-hmm. of it. It'll be hard for me to think of one because it's like instant well, respect. I, yeah. Meaning they, meaning they are open to the information and they want the information. Look at those around Brother Farrakhan. Yeah. Just look at those around him. I mean, no look question. at those around him. You wouldn't even, a lot of these ones, you wouldn't even know they was conscious because these would be kind of the people we always talking about. Yeah. But they are conscious. But they appeal to a certain audience. But see, we did that too in the Nation of Islam. Cool in the gang, you know, for that day and time. Sure. But it wasn't raunchy or nothing like that. Joe Tex. Joe right? Tex. So he went from one extreme, then he had to come over here with the righteousness of it. Then you mm-hmm. had um, a lot of brothers and sisters, um, like you said, the, the, the Delphonics were here. Yeah, going, going way back. Even the sister that they did Cadillac Records. That was uh, the Cadillac record. Uh, Eddie James. Yeah, Eddie James. I mean, when yeah. I interviewed the pioneers in the Nation of Islam with Muhammad Ali and all that, it was like Eddie James had the lessons. And, you know, Sam Cooke had the lessons. It was like, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. So he was know. writing their letters and everything. I was like, really? So really, being that these are our people, once you get up close to them and talk to them, uh, many of them would gravitate toward the knowledge of self, which they do. And that's why they come to brother Minister Farrakhan and have so much respect. I think we just got to do more of the work in embracing them. And embracing um, them. Right. And where they're at, because the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan is meeting them where they're at, which is the same right. thing that the father, Allah, Clara 13X did. Mm-hmm. We'll meet you where you at. You know what I mean? So that's kind of the purpose of the five percenters, in a sense, is to kind of get behind, you know, one of the things that the Honorable Mr. Farrakhan said in a meeting at FOI, like what is the military, right? Mm-hmm. Tactics. Strategy. Right, they, <laughs> they go behind, you know, enemy lines, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of the five percenters, like I said, at the beginning of hip hop, you know, in that culture, the subculture, yeah, they were smoking weed and drinking and all of that, but also rapping this information and knowledge. And one of the things that when Clarence 13 X first started the five percenters, in 1964, he got arrested in 1965 for having a cipher for teaching the youth. Mm-hmm. Police said, oh, we're going to eliminate that. They came and arrested him while he was out there teaching in front mm-hmm. of the Hotel Teresa. And um, when they locked him up, they said, OK, he's insane, saying he's God. Right. So from 1965 to 1967, he was locked away in an institution. And the big thing that happened at that time in New York is that they got flooded and inundated with drugs, with heroin. So a lot of the youth, if you read a lot of the testimonies of the youth in the 60s, they were on heroin, you know, at 12, at 13. So it appeared that the powers that be targeted that same demographic that the Nation of Islam or the five percenters had targeted targeted. uh, when it got to the youth. And when brother, when brother Clanther Dicks got out of prison and he had a big parliament, you know, as soon as he got out and had like a thousand brothers and sisters there, he said that. I can see that you brothers and sisters have been teaching because look at all of the babies. You know what yeah. I left? There were some of you, but now look at all of you. Look at these young babies. He said that if you continue studying this wisdom, meaning the lessons, i.e. the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he said mm-hmm. you will become pace setters of the world. You will become pace setters of the world if you carry this information. And again, mm-hmm. each one teach one. And just a few years after that, like I said, um, when they started hip hop in 73, those brothers and sisters was influenced by the language of the lessons, right? Mm-hmm. And that's how all that came to be, Grandmaster Flash, like he said, the message mm-hmm. and all these mm-hmm. powerful messages that started coming out. The Zulu mm-hmm. Nation, I mean, Zulu you know, Nation. Yeah. right, the Zulu, Zulu Nation. Nation. These youth um, organizations all had different aspects of the lessons and that's what made it so powerful, but the thing I want to touch on real quickly is that when he came out and he said, you will become pace setters of the world, he also recognized that it was this epidemic going on. And the Mm -hmm. epidemic was heroin addiction. It was heroin addiction. So he had to teach the five percenters how to come up out of that situation. Mm -hmm. He said, the best thing you can do if you want to cure an ill is the fast. As Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught and how to eat to live, that's the same principles adopted by the nat- by the five percent nation. He said, he said, uh, we gotta master all things. 
And they said, well, how do you master drugs? How do you master heroin? He said, the best way to master it is to leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> he said, leave it alone. <laughs> so he said, eventually, you will get to a point where you purify yourself, where you'll be living in accordance with the dietary laws of the most honorable mm -hmm. Elijah Muhammad in the nation of Islam. We won't be smoking, we won't be drinking, we won't be uh, you know, intoxicated, uh, gambling, mm -hmm. and doing all these different things that cause disunity and hatred and enmity amongst our people. So mm -hmm. that's what I think the purpose of um, the negative aspect of corporate America or the powers that be within the government, the counterintelligence program did by pushing the drugs on the youth in the same way they pushing this thing, this negative message on the youth. All we got to do is tell them and show them eventually how to assist, leave it alone and do for self mm -hmm. you know, and make the messages and make the music that you want to make. And I think the nation of Islam is in a position to do that. And our people are doing it. They're out there doing it right now as we speak. So it's not a do yeah. thing for hip hop. Hip hop is going to be all right, ultimately, because uh, the God is in control of all things, right? Yeah. And not a lot. So it's going to be all right. And now, Donald Wilson Louis Farrakhan has already showed up the example. Mm -hmm. And at the core of this thing was the regality of the nation of Islam. And I'll tell you this real quick. In the beginning, there's five elements of hip hop, right? You got DJing, rapping, graffiti, break dancing, and the fifth element is knowledge, mm -hmm. right? And so say like the culture and fashion. Now we will call B boys in the beginning. B boy, and the way that we, the way you can tell a B boy, is almost by what they call like a B boy stance, right? When you see the B boy stance, uh -huh. you know the B boy stance is. The B boy stance, right? Right, this is what brother Michael is doing. The B boy stance comes straight from the FOI. You know, when the FOI would be on post, stand a perpendicular in the square, cross like this, and you'll see a uh, you'll see an iconic picture of the Father Allah, but the Clarence thirteen X, uh -huh. his right hand man, with the James one hundred and nine X, old man Justice, in the same format, stand a perpendicular on the square, and. The FOI used to do it, like in the 50s and the 60s, we still do it. And this was picked up, of course, by the five percenters. And then when hip hop started, they emulated what they saw the five percenters doing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of ways they carry themselves in a regal way, in a positive way, mm -hmm. even down to the walk, came from like the military aspect of the nation of Islam. So that's like a little known fact that exists out there, but everybody should know uh -huh. that. And even our words, cipher, science, that's you right. know, doing the knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, born day, mm -hmm. peace, That's all right. of the early language or the foundation, foundational language of mm -hmm. hip hop came, i.e. through the five percenters, through the language of the lessons. It is no mystery. We say the language of the lessons, but the lessons, again, is from the minds of Master Prophet Muhammad and Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So we extracted those words that they would use and we took it and we ingratiated that into the culture that became hip hop, that fifth element, you no know, being knowledge. So as long as that knowledge is there, we're gonna eventually be all right because knowledge, as we talk in the nation of Islam, purifies, you know, eventually mm -hmm. purifies oneself. And that's, yeah. um, so I think we in good hands, beloved brother, eventually and so, only. So you have any any closing thoughts? Cause we're, we're at the end of time again, mm -hmm. man. And you just, you just um, unlocking and unpacking a lot of stuff. Uh, for us to, to really think about. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, and I guess I'm just concerned with the hypnotic, the social hypnotic effect on young people as everybody's trying to get to what can we do to stop the killing? Mm -hmm. right. uh, and I know in the city of Philadelphia, they're desperate now uh, uh, with the number of shootings uh, escalating. But um, they, you know, we want to throw money at problems of whether well, they, these young people need jobs or they need uh, uh, something better here, but it's always coming down to some money and throwing money at problems and, and no one's looking at the spiritual deficits um, and, and the absence of what the minister calls requisite knowledge. It's one thing to get knowledge. It's another whole thing to get the kind of knowledge that you need that as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, that gets you up off of your knees and begins to break your mental chains mm -hmm. uh, where you can think 
not only think, but think critically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, sir. I think that what you're doing, you and Brother Michael, is very powerful. Uh, even the theme of the show, the souls of Black folk, that's what we're here for. We are here to save souls. We are fighting <laughs> for the souls of our people. And that's why I said at the core of that is Black music. You know, mm -hmm. listen to the music. It's coming from your mind. It's the rhythm, you know, it's all from yeah. God. It's like the beat coming from the sun. So the soul of black folk is what we need to appeal to and having a format of such and brother, and I'm honored just to be a guest on this show, especially to be Man. the first guest well, on we're this show. Honored to, we are honored to have had you and um, mm -hmm. we pray to Allah that he continue to bless you in that. This uh, hopefully won't be the last time we hear from you on the Souls of Black Folk broadcast. And uh, we'll be reaching out for you again, but please, please stay in touch. And yes, we're going to keep putting your books out there in, in future editions of uh, The Souls of Black Folks. Yes, sir. So, Thank so you, for brother. everyone out there, uh, you've been listening to Wakil Allah, um, an author, an activist, and obviously someone to help us articulate the problems of our day. Uh, to me, um, remember the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan when he started rebuilding the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's work that um, an organized lie will always have the upper hand over disorganized truth. So we don't just need the truth, but we need to organize uh, ourselves around the truth. And so uh, in future shows, we have to take a deeper dive into that also. So thank you, Wakil Allah. Thank, thank you, Brother you. Michael. Thank, you, brother thank all of you out there for listening to Souls of Black Folks. Aisalaamu Alaikum. <laughs>